Chapter 1 Amber would have to take things one step at a time, she realized, as she walked across the warm sands, trying her best to keep in as much shade from the palm trees lining the beach as possible, cradling her son, baby Bray, gently in her arms. You sure look like your daddy, Amber uttered lovingly, gazing at the child she and Bray had brought into the world. She thought back to moments of her son's young existence so far, scattered memories appearing in her mind, feelings from the past. She recalled when she first found out she was pregnant, the difficult birth she'd endured, and the tragic disappearance of Bray, her soulmate, at the onset of the techno invasion. For so long she thought she would never see Bray again, but fate had been kind, surprising both Amber and Bray with their reunion just days before. Her son had his father back. Amber had initially felt thrilled, overjoyed, lost for words. To see Bray again, to hold him, embrace him, hear his voice, it was more than a dream come true. The impossible had happened. A miracle had occurred. Yet she was struggling, because in the time Bray had been lost, presumably forever, she had given her heart away to another, to Jay. Soon after Bray's return, he and Jay made an agreement where they would give Amber the space and time she needed. They recognized things would not be easy for her, let alone themselves, and Amber was truly grateful for their empathy. Bray was sensitive to her existing relationship with Jay, and for his part, Jay himself was acutely aware of Amber's feelings for Bray and how their own past relationship had been broken by the cruel hand of fate brought about by the invasion of the city by the Techno tribe, an offensive that Jay had himself at the time ironically, being a pivotal figure in bringing to fruition. However, several days had now elapsed, and each passing hour made Amber's situation more unbearable. She loved them, both, in different ways. Circumstances had led to her entering into a relationship with each in their own time. She remembered reading about brides in wars of history past who believed their husbands had died and who had subsequently remarried, only to find their husbands returning to them after the war's end. Never had she thought that such a similar situation would ever occur to her. It was none of their fault, certainly not their choice, to be in this position. Amber was grateful that Bray was still alive, for being brought back to her, as if from the dead. But now she needed to decide if she would alter the future course of her life. At a crossroads, she had to go down a path, to continue her journey. It could not be with them both. It had to be one or the other. Bray or Jay. And she had no idea which way to choose. Taking a deep breath, Amber dug deep into the fiber of her soul, trying to find strength, resolve. She promised that for her baby's sake, as well as that of Bray and Jay, she would face up to this most difficult decision. Somehow, In some way, the dilemma they were in had to be broken. For now, she would just have to take things one hour at a time, day by day, one step at a time. Besides, there were other issues and priorities she had to contend with before even contemplating a future, such as the survival of all within her beloved tribe, along with others they had recently met. Amber joined the rest of the Morats further down the beach. They were gathering together beside an open fire, the welcome aroma of freshly cooked seafood wafting around a Selene grilled meal fit for the occasion on the bright fiery embers. It smells great, Emma complimented, as Bray led her by the hand, guiding her to find a place to sit among the others. Extra portions for all those who praise my cooking, Selene joked. In that case, hail Selene, queen of cuisine, Sammy said drooling at the prospect of lunch and trying to ingratiate himself as Selene began passing around servings. Bray carefully handed Emma a plate full of food. Though not exactly a plate, but served in a coconut shell, Emma given him a lovely smile of appreciation. Emma was blind, having lost her sight in a mysterious explosion that apparently occurred on the island during the final days of the adults. She had met Bray when he stumbled into her life, Emma having lived as a refugee at Arthur's Air Force Base, the place she had been evacuated to during the virus with her younger brother, Shannon, and sister, Tiffany, 
who now took their places on the beach sitting beside her. Bray and Emma had gotten to know each other well during their time together, forming a close bond. Bray was protective and respected Emma's will to survive, her dutiful loving care and looking after her much younger siblings. She was kind, gentle, and in turn had come to appreciate Bray's own steely resolve and determination to look after others and make the post-adult world a better place to live in. Emma couldn't help but feel a sense of jealousy. Bray and Emma had shared many experiences together, so perhaps it was only natural they would be on close terms, Emma reflected. But was there something more to it? A hint of a greater relationship than merely being just two friends? She quickly dismissed such notions, not wanting to wallow in jealous thoughts. That served no purpose other than fostering distrust, suspicion, and heartache. The greater truth was that Amber had to be thankful that Bray was alive, and there, after so much time apart. Are you alright? Bray asked Amber as she approached, noticing she seemed preoccupied. I'm fine. Just thinking things over, that's all, Amber smiled to reassure him. Amber was also aware of Jay nearby, standing on the other side of the fire. He gave Amber a loving look when she arrived, and she acknowledged it with a lingering glance of her own. But displaying her innate leadership skills, managed to compartmentalize her personal issues with other priorities needing to be discussed that affected the future of everyone else, the whole tribe, which is why Bray had convened the group meeting together in the first place. That's nearly all of us, Daryl pointed out. Except May, she's still out there, if you know what I mean. Amber could see May in the distance, kneeling down in the sand, staring out to sea, lost in the endless tide of her thoughts. May had spent the last few days much to herself, keeping away from the rest of the tribe. Everyone was sympathetic, realizing that she was still grieving for the loss of Zack, her former boyfriend, who had perished when the tribe was shipwrecked on the island. Sorry, we're late, Leah apologized, approaching the gathering with the priestess and some of her native tribe. They too had been asked to attend the meeting, Bray keen to hear their opinions and knowledge of the island. The Morats had been invited to stay in the native village after celebrating the victory over Blake, but all felt that they needed to return to their encampment on the beach to examine their options. All, of course, except Lex, that is, who considered the village to be absolute paradise. But most suspected it had nothing to do with his pursuit of an apparent idyllic lifestyle. Would you look at that, Lex muttered under his breath, and he gave a breathless wolf whistle, impressed by the sight before him as Leah arrived with the priestess. It was no secret to anyone that Lex was totally infatuated with the priestess, who possessed a spectacular beauty, and in Lex's view, a figure to match. He was also equally enamored of Leah, the girl who he had befriended when he and Jack had initially been captors of the natives. With her attractive looks, golden locks of hair, and bubbly personality, Leah was a prime candidate for Lex's affections. Lex had tried on several occasions to seduce Leah, as well as the priestess, but had been rejected in his efforts to date by both girls, who found Lex's interest in them flattering, as well as an endless source of amusement, yet they had been unwilling to progress matters, not responding to Lex's blatant flirtation with them. This only spurred Lex on further, enjoying the challenge and feeling he was a master in the art of seduction, playing the game. What's so special about them? Del pouted jealously, totally threatened by Lex's obvious interest in the newcomers, his eyes darting back and forth from the priestess to Leah. You've got to be joking. I mean, look at Leah's legs. They seem to go on forever. And the priestess? What a body, Lex said, savoring the sight. Is that all you ever think about, Lex? Del replied. Honestly, how could you? Believe me, I could quite easily, Lex answered. Pervert, Del smarted, giving Lex the cold shoulder. Nothing wrong with admiring the scenery, Lex defended himself. We've got more important things to discuss, Lex, Amber said. All agreed, and went over the immediate problems they had to address, such as what could have occurred to Ram. Jay had organized a search party and spent time scouting the local area over the past few days, but so far there was no sign of Ram and his captors, and even the best native trackers couldn't pick up any hint of a possible direction they had taken. But one thing was certain, they were not in the vicinity. There were no clues whatsoever to explain what could have possibly happened. The last time Ram had been seen, the former leader of the Technos was captured by Ebony, Axel, and some of the guards who had been in the Legion, the tribe led by Blake, that had previously dominated the region before being defeated by the alliance of the Morats and the native tribe. Where had Ebony and Axel taken Ram? 
Was he still alive? A prisoner somewhere? Would they return? Ebony and Axel had come so close to kidnapping Trudy and Brady, the two of them important and no doubt valuable due to their association and past history of Zoot, the infamous and legendary deceased leader of the Locos, who with his notorious tribe had once been the scourge of the Morrats' own home city. Ram had revealed to Jay and the other Morrats, just prior to his disappearance, the existence of a potentially enormous threat, the Collective, an association of tribes originating from faraway lands who had joined together and were seeking to extend their power and influence to one day take over Amber's own home region and city, or so Ram had claimed. Were the Collective somehow ominously present on the island as Ram had feared? Was there an enemy force heading right now to attack the Morats? Or was it all a big pretense, a false story concocted by Ram for his own reasons? The enigmatic and mischievous leader of the Technos had certainly spun several webs of lies over the years, and was responsible for so many troubles to hit the Morats and countless others. Was Blake, the leader of the Legion tribe, himself still alive and on the island, biding his time, waiting to strike back and gain revenge against the Morats? Bray was more concerned about Alois, whom he had been a prisoner of at a mysterious base left over from the adult times, in the mountains up in the north of the island. Alois led, or manipulated more aptly, Bray felt, a cult-like group who worshipped Bray's brother, Zoot, believing him to be some sort of new god. Bray had been subject to all kinds of torments in his captivity under Alois and her Zootists, who had tried to use Bray, a living link to Zoot's bloodline, exploiting him in the pursuit of a twisted religion. Bray had only just managed to make an escape, which led to his epic journey from the north, bringing him eventually back to Amber and the Morrats. Amber wondered if Alois was linked in with the Collective somehow, and what her connection had been, if any, with Blake and his Legion tribe, who had been stationed in the southern part of the island. Leah translated as the priestess and the natives who accompanied her were questioned by the Morrats, probing if they had any other knowledge or insight. They explained they knew nothing of Alois or the strange adult base up in the mountains where Bray said he had been imprisoned. Emma gave an account of the lives she and her brother and sister had experienced at Arthur's Air Force Base a tragic tale where their own tribe of evacuated refugees, the Roaches, had gradually been whittled away, its members disappearing, leaving just Emma and the remnants of her family behind. Emma suspected the Roaches must have been captured, traded as slaves by Blake. Had they been handed to the Collective, or to Alois and the Zootists? Well, I think whoever she is, the further away this Alois is from us, the better, Trudy said. She seems horrible. She makes Ebony sound like my guardian angel. So, any thoughts? Jay asked aloud. Everything seems a priority. There's Ram, what happened to Ebony, the Collective, Alois, and Rizutists. I don't know about the rest of you, Lex spoke up, but I vote we do nothing. You're kidding, Celine challenged him. I'm not joking, I'm serious. For all we know, Ram could have been telling Porkies with the story of the Collective, playing some kind of mind games with us. The more I think about it, I reckon we should just stay here and enjoy all that paradise has to offer. We can't just do nothing, Lex, Amber said. Are you really suggesting you want to sit around chasing coconuts while others suffer? What if there are more prisoners out there right now like Bray had been? What if there isn't? Lex didn't back down. I feel for anyone who goes through what Bray did, believe me. But maybe Alois, Ram, the Collective are all history, gone. They might not even still be on the island. If the Collective are here, then I don't exactly see them. Lex theatrically looked around, making his point clear. Seems like it's just us. And I mean, look at this place. It's beautiful. Let's live it up a bit. Enjoy being away from the hassles, rather than going out looking for them. If there's trouble out there, we can't just ignore it, Bray said disapprovingly. Bray's right. None of us could be safe, Emma agreed. If you want to side with Bray, then that's up to you, Lex said. But I've got the right to my own opinions, and the best thing I reckon we should do is stay exactly where we are." He cast an admiring glance at the priestess and Lear, which registered with Amber, who had heard enough. And it wasn't just a reference to Emma siding with Bray. Amber was genuinely concerned that Lex was so seemingly oblivious to the potential dangers that could lay in store, blinded by the obvious attraction he felt for the native girls. You may want to live in paradise, Lex, and try and single-handedly repopulate the world with your offspring. You bet I would, Lex interrupted. Amber continued. But who's to say you're right? And what if you're wrong? You work hard building some sort of new life here, but then one day, you're lying there on the beach, working on your tan, 
And what if Ram does come back, with Ebony and the entire collective on their heels? Your fantasy could easily turn into a nightmare all of a sudden. An uneasy silence descended on the group as they assimilated the threat posed by Amber's words. Well, I don't know about anyone else, but I plan on leaving soon, Bray eventually announced. What do you mean? Amber protested. I have to find out more about Eloise, Bray explained. All were aware that during the time Bray was held prisoner he had been exposed to a horrific existence. An existence he couldn't articulate. Especially after being tormented, or tortured more like, by apparent virtual reality brainwashing. All in the name of his late brother, Martin, who had chosen a different path to bring about change in the world after all the adults had perished. And although Bray in no way endorsed his brother's ideology, he felt that Martin had lost his way and the persona of his alter ego, Zoot, was now being dangerously fueled by the likes of Alois, who seemed to be intent on manipulating all his brother's followers, the Zootists, with a fanaticism that would bring about nothing more than a wake of devastation and destruction. I'll go alone if I have to. I don't expect anyone else to put themselves in danger. I'll go with you, Jay volunteered, and who knows, maybe we'll find Ram along the way. Bray was touched by Jay's support, especially to come from such an unexpected source. The two obviously had more in common than their rivalry for Amber's heart. I'll go too, Emma announced. There's a surprise, Lex snidely remarked. Amber cast him a look, then considered Bray. Do you think that's a good idea, Bray? Please don't patronize me, Emma said quietly. I'm quite capable. I'm sure you are, Emma. I didn't mean anything by it. We just have to try and work out a strategy. Who'll go, who'll stay? Well, I reckon I should keep an eye on our native friends here in the village, Lex suggested. I'm sure they can look after themselves, Lex, Gel sighed. I'm with you, Bray, Ellie said, standing to show her support. Absolutely, Slade agreed. And one by one the others got up, showing their solidarity. Lex... Intransigent, being the last one still sitting on the warm sands of the beach. Better pack my things, Jack said, having gotten to his feet beside Ellie. Sounds like we've all got a long journey ahead. No, not all, Jack, Amber stated. We've got to make sure the little ones are taken care of, she added, glancing at Trudy clutching Brady in her arms. Emma hugging her younger brother and sister. Ruby instinctively putting her hands protectively on her pregnant belly, imagining the child within and what kind of world he or she would be born into. And clearly, Amber felt the same sentiment as she leaned over and planted a kiss on Baby Bray's cheek. It was finally decided that an exploration party, led by Bray, Amber and Jay, would investigate the other parts of the island, starting out with Emma's old home, Arthur's Air Force Base. Accompanying them would be Jack, Ellie, Gail, Daryl, Emma, Shannon and Tiffany. And they hoped they could find out what had happened to Ram and some more information about the collective, Bray intent on ultimately discovering more about Eloise and her fanatical Zootist followers. The rest would remain in the native village. Prior to their departure, the priestess gave a traditional blessing, slowly arcing her arms in a circle, moving them gracefully with meaningful intent in the direction of Amber and the rest of the exploration party. What's she doing? Jay had asked, recognizing it was a gesture of some significance. She's giving you a blessing, Leah explained, asking the ancestors to watch over you, to give you good fortune. Please thank her. We'll hopefully be back in a few days, Amber responded, touched by the priestess's consideration. Amber realized that for all of her irritation and questioning Lex's motives on wishing to stay behind, there was no one better than Lex to work with the priestess and her warriors to make sure the village was protected. The priestess had proposed that instead of living at Camp Phoenix, the makeshift beach encampment they'd been in so far, the remaining mole rats who were going to be left behind were welcome to share in the greater comfort and security of the native village until the exploration party returned. Celine was going to stay to help look after Amber and Bray's son, along with Brady, Lottie and Sammy, and to help watch over May, who was still bereaved. Leah would be with them, acting as translator between the mole rats in the village and the priestess. Leah having learnt to speak the native language fluently after living with the priestess and her tribe in the past. She had offered Lottie and Sammy some lessons, 
Sammy particularly excited by the prospect, more due to having developed a crush on Leah. Trudy had wanted to go along to help Bray, to give him her support, but everyone else felt it was more important for Trudy, due to her past personal association with Zoot, to wait with Brady and hopefully keep far away from any potential dangers that they could possibly otherwise be exposed to by getting closer to Eloise and the Zootists. Or even Ebony and Axel, in case their paths did cross. Ebony and Axel had, after all, tried previously to kidnap Trudy and her daughter. Other mole rats staying behind were Ruby and Slade. Ruby was pregnant with Slade's child, and the overall feeling was she couldn't risk endangering her own health or that of her unborn child by taking part in the long journey. Slade, similarly, was still recovering from the severe injuries he had suffered in the shipwreck of the cargo ship, the Zhao Li, when it had ran aground several weeks earlier. It was thought also as an expectant father, he would be best served to be with Ruby and their baby she was carrying inside her. Lex had apologised to Bray for coming across previously as appearing insensitive and had, in the end, volunteered to go on the expedition. Ironically, he had been first surprised, then thrilled, when Amber and Bray thought Lex would be best served by staying at the village and making sure the others were well protected. And he was totally up for that. You be careful, Lex said, extending his hand, which Bray shook. You too. Ray responded. Don't worry about us. I'll keep my eye on everyone. Unable to help himself, Lex found his peripheral vision drawn to Leah, standing enticingly near him. I'm sure you will, Amber replied, never ceasing to be amazed by Lex's roguish ways. But he meant well, and could contribute more by being at the village, Amber was certain, than by being pressured into going along on the trip. Ready? Bray asked Emma. No, Emma smiled bravely. But what choice do we have? Just make sure it's not the blind leading the blind, Lex said, cringing as everyone cast him a disdainful glance. You know what I mean, he said, faking a smile. All indeed understood Lex's concern, and without being unkind to Emma, probably shared it, questioning the wisdom of Emma embarking upon the mission. Having gotten to know her well, Bray was acutely aware of Emma's purity of feeling and her innate sensitivity, and that in making their return journey, they would be retracing their steps, going back to a difficult place they had both once been before in their lives. The plan was for Emma to act as the guide for the exploration party when they eventually got to Arthur's Air Force Base. After all, she had lived there ever since the adult days, and, even though she was restricted by her blindness, Emma knew the layout of the base well, and would be a useful source of information about her former home. Secretly, she couldn't deny, however, that she was scared about the prospect of the journey they were about to undertake. The ghosts of her past frightened her, but she had long ago resolved to confront any obstacle in her path even although she at times was filled with doubt. Amber felt uncomfortable to see Bray hand in hand guiding Emma, but she understood he was just being supportive, even if a part of her couldn't help but feel envious of the attention Bray was giving. They set out, the rest of the exploration party followed behind. Turning, Amber gave one last look at baby Bray, cradled in Celine's arm. Celine playfully waving the baby's hands goodbye to his mother as the group set out. Amber held back her tears. She had to go on this journey, to bear the pain of separation at being away from her son, precisely for his sake. She was determined to make sure he had a better future. It was time to get on with the next chapter of their lives. <laughs>